Welcome everyone to the Historic Preservation Board's um, study session on, let's see, what's the date? March 21st, 2022 at 6.29, 6.30 p.m. Um, let's see, and since we have um, a study session, uh, we can just go ahead and jump in. We don't need a quorum or anything like that because this isn't a meeting. Um, all right, and I understand you want to kind of flop the uh, order of the presentations tonight? Yes, please. Uh, with your permission, we'd like to have the update on the Canary Barn as the first item. And then uh, we have some uh, presenters who are here, and they can uh, do their presentation and, and uh, uh, have a discussion with the board, and then they don't have to sit all the way through. They get the, to keep their evening. The window. <laughs> you don't want to sit here and discuss games. windows with us. I mean, <laughs> come on. Watch a hockey game. I know they are. <laughs> okay, I think that that would be fine. Um, so I guess uh, I would ask staff to go ahead and and begin. Um, Thank you, uh, Chairperson Fields. The, my name is Mike Sutherland. I'm the Deputy Director of Community, De Community Development. And um, I have with me here um, Brad Dixon uh, from Toll Brothers and Jonathan Adkins from Toll Brothers. And um, this is a bit of an unusual item for our study session uh, today. We have an application that's currently in process in, uh, in the planning division for a site development plan and a um, subdivision plat for a 77 acre parcel um, located on the west side of South Santa Fe between C470 and Mineral. Uh, the site development plan is for a 260 unit subdivision of single family attached homes. And this is, uh, this is the Cogdell property. Wendy, Wendy Cogdell, the owner, is here in the, in the audience. And she is actively selling the, the property to Toll Brothers for development. And part of the property is a, uh, a barn called the Bank Barn or the Canary Barn. This barn is not designated as a historic landmark or a historic structure in any way. Uh, but the applicant uh, would like to incorporate the barn into their development. And um, we thought it would be a good idea to at least bring it before you as a study session, even though there's no um, action required of the board or there's no preservation of the, of the historic structure. Um, Andrea, do you know uh, a little bit of history on the bank barn that you can share with the board? I hate to put you on the spot like that, but... Well, it's been quite some time since I've reviewed those materials. Okay. okay. Um, but yeah, as you said, it is a bank barn, meaning that you enter on one side, and if you were to continue through the barn, it would be down below at the second, at a lower level, because there is a bank within the existing... <laughs> Uh, terrain of the, of the site. And the, the barn has been there for quite some time as part of that large property and it is historically significant but it is in poor shape as I think we'll learn. Thank you. Do we have an idea of when that, that barn was constructed? 1918. 1918. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, oh yes. It's also um, been determined eligible for the National Register. Louder, please. It's also yeah. been determined eligible for the National Register. Pardon? 
Pardon? It's also been determined eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. Well, we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, if you can't hear, uh, just raise your hand and we'll speak louder. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank uh, so you, Chris. So with that, uh, I, I neglected to uh, list um, Jonathan Adkins' name as a, as a presenter uh, for tonight's meeting. But with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Jonathan and Brad, and I'll, uh, I'll control the presentation as you go through. Okay. Just let me know when to change the slide. Okay, thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you to everyone for uh, having us tonight. Um, we wanted to speak to you about our development and also the barn that's on the development and our plans. Um, Parkview on the Platte is the name of this development. That uh, will be the marketing name. Next slide. A little bit about Toll Brothers. We are a national uh, home builder, publicly traded. We operate in 24 states, 60 markets. Uh, as you can see, we build here in Colorado from Colorado Springs, up through the metro area, up to Fort Collins. We have a heavy presence on the East Coast, headquartered in Philadelphia. We also have a heavy presence on the West Coast as well. Next slide. Background on our project, we are the master developer and builder for this project. Uh, as Mike stated, it's a 77 acre site. We have two residential parcels, which will comprise of 393 um, townhome units. We have a multifamily parcel, which will uh, contain 258 apartment units approximately. And there's also two commercial parcels. Those proposed uses vary, but it could include a grocery store, quick serve restaurants, a brewery, a bank or gas station. Next slide. Um, I think most people are familiar with the location of this project. If you're not, we have a yellow pin on the map. Uh, we are north of 470 and on the west side of Santa Fe. Next slide. Here you can see a zoom in of our site. The commercial parcels will be to the north. They will border Santa Fe. Also to the south along Santa Fe is the apartment parcel. The two residential parcels are to the west, closer to the river, uh, and we expect those to generate 393 residential units. Next slide. So here's what we're here to talk about this evening, the Canary Farm Barn. A little bit of background on it. It was constructed in 1918 by J.D. Canary. It's part of the Wild Acre Ranch. It was sold in 1932 to Charles Phillips who then used the land for a cattle grazing operation. And then in the mid 1940s, it was sold to Kenton Enzer. The property was uh, considered very seriously for a suburban housing development in the 1950s. And in 1962, uh, it was turned into a um, turf farm. The barn was used to store uh, cultivation equipment. In 2020, Toll Brothers hired uh, Brian Saferth and Associates to review the structural stability of the barn. The professional engineer's findings stated that the roof is completely incapable of supporting the current required snow loads. When loading exceeds the listed capacity of the side shear walls, and in its current condition, the building is neither safe for occupation nor moving to a new location. I will make note that the structural engineer during his site visit, was uncomfortable being in the barn. He felt it was a safety risk. Uh, now allow me to show you a few close-up photos of the barn. So this is the front of the barn. Uh, most of us have seen this from Santa Fe Drive. As you can see, the roof has deteriorated quite a bit, and there's also hazards on the floor there where some of the timbers have fallen through. Next slide. South side of the structure. Again, the roof is not in great shape, neither is the exterior. There's some storage items uh, along the side of the barn there. This is the rear of the, the barn. This is the um, bank barn or the walkout portion of the barn. Next slide. And this is the south side of the barn. So this is the side that receives the majority of the sunlight. As you can see, the roof is uh, in very poor shape. And then if you look down low at the uh, concrete foundation, there is uh, a degraded concrete foundation with structural issues there as well. 
Uh, next up is a photo of the interior. Uh, as you can see, uh, years of neglect and use as an equipment storage building have left, have left the interior of the barn in poor condition. Also presents uh, several challenges. It's uh, structurally unsound, as we mentioned earlier. We also have concerns about asbestos and lead paint and lead piping that were used in the original construction. Uh, as part of this development, we recognize the importance of the barn and the role that it plays in Littleton's heritage. We did consider moving the barn as constructed, but it was unfeasible due to the structural, environmental, safety, and economical issues as discussed earlier. After considering all of these issues, we put together a plan that we'd like to present tonight. We feel it honors the history of the structure and will provide a landmark gathering place for generations to come here in Littleton. So this is our proposed reconstructed barn. We'll have a rendering here in a couple of slides, but this is um, an elevation drawing, very similar to the current barn. Next slide. Inside of this structure, we'll have picnic tables. Uh, it can be used for individuals or groups. So we envision this as a gathering place. Next slide. And here is the renderings of the barn um, completed. So as you can see, it will be a replica barn. It will use modern materials. It will be built to modern uh, building code, and it can be enjoyed for a long time. Uh, our plan is to take the timbers that can be salvaged from the inside of the existing barn and reuse them on the interior, not as structural elements, uh, but as architectural um, design elements. And it also has that gambrel style roof that really um, pays homage to the uh, original barn. The location of the replica barn will be further to the west than where the current barn sits. The current barn sits where the apartment parcel is drawn. It will be 850 feet away from Santa Fe Drive. It's currently about 150 feet away. Uh, this is going to help uh, address the traffic and the noise that comes from Santa Fe and it's going to allow the barn to sit in a location that is a little bit more in line um, with its historic setting prior to the development of this part of town. Um, one of the reasons we chose this location is also for access to the broader community. Um, as you can see, that's I've, we've drawn a red line on here. This is how you'd access it from a vehicle coming off of Santa Fe. It's quite easy to get to. It'll be open to the public. And then also the trail system you can see on there is a multimodal trail system. And this will connect both south to the Walhurst community and north to the light rail station. So whether you're walking, jogging, biking, or driving, uh, folks around the community can stop and enjoy this new structure. So our next steps. Um, you know, we, we want this to be a community gathering place and also a celebration of the agricultural and ranching history of Littleton and this part of town. We have hired a professional consultant who is helping us to gather documents which we can put together to tell the story of the area and to tell the story of the structure. Uh, we plan on installing interpretive panels, signage, and placards around the barn. We also use historic photography. And as mentioned earlier, salvage materials will be uh, reused to enhance the interior of the structure and provide historic context. And so the one thing that we wanted to ask the board tonight is if there is um, any other items um, that the community would like to see included in this um, reconstructed barn. All right, does that include, uh, conclude your presentation? It does, you can hit the next slide. Okay, um, before we uh, get into any discussion, I, I'd like to ask Mike, um, please clarify uh, I I exactly what you expect of us. Yes. Um, it, you know, and I think we should state that uh, the barn does not have any protections on it now. It's not a protected structure. It is not in a historic district um, or anything like that. So um, what, what would you have us do tonight? So that's a great question, uh, Chair Fields. So I would suggest that if you had any questions for 
uh, Toll Brothers about what they plan to do, this is a good time to uh, ask those questions. If you have uh, comments on either the look of the barn or um, or anything like uh, uh, location or look, now's the time to get those comments out. Um, and really, that uh, uh, is what I would expect uh, of the of the board tonight. And uh, you know, any feedback that the board could give. I know it's uh, probably the board the the wish of the board might be to preserve the barn in place uh, would always be the the best uh, you know mm -hmm. preservation of the of the historic structure, but knowing that that is not uh, something that we can require of the applicant, uh, working with their plan to um, to relocate the barn and and well not relocate the barn, but basically rebuild a, a, a community structure uh, that resembles the barn. Uh, that, you know, knowing that information, what, uh, what would the board suggest on, on uh, how they could do this uh, better? Or, uh, you know, if there are any, any uh, suggestions you can make, this is the time to ask. Was that unclear or clear? <laughs> no, I mean that that's clear. Okay. Um, and uh, does anyone have any comments? <laughs> Do you want to go first? Yep. Sure. Amy? Doesn't matter. Okay, sure. Go ahead, Amy. So thank you so much for sharing the presentation. And it's the, as a board member, I appreciate the opportunity to like learn about what's happening to this structure that we've kind of been watching for a while. Um, just a quick question. It's it's not totally clear from your renderings. I don't know how you know to scale or whatever they are. But with with the new location and looking at the renderings, the new barn will it just be one story or are you, so you're not planning to replicate the bank barn aspect? No, correct? we are not. It'll be one story. Um, part of that reason is is for accessibility, so so folks with limited mobility can get into that area easier. So rather than a two story with right, a two story, correct? Okay, thank you. Okay, Chris. Um, mine are just comments, and I, I realize like this is kind of already decided. Um, so I appreciate the fact that we get to look at this, but um, I, you know, I, I've been in historic preservation for twenty four years. I've seen barns in so much worse condition than this that have been restored. Uh, you know, it's. I feel like it's a matter of if somebody wanted to make this happen, it would be restored. Um, I, I kind of looked up the um, consultants who did the um, engineering assessment. I don't know what their background is. It, it, I couldn't tell like if they've done a lot in historic preservation, um, but there are a lot of um, engineering firms and historical architects, um, one who is on our board who is not here tonight, um, who have looked at this barn and, and don't necessarily come to the same conclusion. Um, Chris, I'm going to stop you right there. Mm -hmm. Rick's not here. Right. And um, we, we really can't bring up things that Rick may have said or felt or anything okay. like that. So. Um, so, oh, okay. I'll just, I'll read my comments then. So I realize this is a business trend transaction. And, um, but, you know, this barn is one of the last physical links um, to Littleton's agricultural history. Um, I know barns. I, I worked all around the state with barns, and um, bank barns are very unusual in Colorado. And I went and tracked all the barns in Littleton, and we have, I don't know, five left. And now we're going to lose this one. It just, it really breaks my heart. And to put a, a replica, I mean, I, I get it. It's a nod to the agricultural history, but it's not this barn. And we have this barn. This is like one of the last tangible links to Littleton's agricultural history. And, you know, it's eligible for the National Register. It could get designated. It could get a grant to do a historical structure assessment from top to bottom, inside and out. It could get grant money to be restored. I mean, I, I appreciate reusing materials. But then you guys mentioned asbestos. And 1918 would be unusual to have asbestos in this building as an original building material. Um, so you guys are still going to have to deal with asbestos when you take this apart and the lead paint. I mean, regardless, 
whether it stays or goes. Somebody's going to have to deal with asbestos. You deal with it more if you destroy the building and disturb it. So that's something to keep in mind. And then um, the only other thing, you know, that I want to say is um, I was just wondering who the um, consultants who are doing the research are. Like, do they have a background in history? I'm just curious who yeah. it is. That's a, that's a good question. Let me uh, first address one of your comments. So say for who is the um, structural engineer we hired, they do have a background in historical structures. That's really their specialty. Okay. A couple of examples is the Inglewood train station down the street from mm -hmm. here. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. involved in that, um, moving that building and, and restoring that building. The barn out near DIA when you're on Pena Boulevard, just as it hooks to the east. I'm sure you've seen that barn. I, I worked on the National Register nomination for it. So okay, so, very so they, worked on, they worked on both okay. of those projects, I, I didn't recognize yeah. their name at all, and I sure. used to work for the State Preservation Office, and I was like, who are these people? Sure. Um, and they didn't have it on their website that they had worked on them. So sure. I was kind of curious. Um, for current consultants, we have an archaeologist and a historian who is uh, through ERO, who is one of our consultants. I mean, I, I do. I appreciate it. And, and I know you guys, I mean, it, you're a business, and <laughs> your business is to make things work and, and make the money. And um, But every time I drive by this building, I'm like, oh my God, it's still there. And I'm going to drive by it one day, and it's not going to be there anymore. And that really makes me sad. And I just saw a building demolished on Colfax the other day. And I, I drove by and, and cried as I took pictures as the digger was going through it. So it's just, I mean, it's always built something new instead of how do we save the old and keep those tangible links to our history. So that's all I've got. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Are there any other comments for our applicant? I have some. Obviously, you're at the Historic Preservation Board. You know that we are going to um, prefer that it would be preserved in place, like Mike said. Oh, uh, would you mind speaking up? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the worst spot. <laughs> Obviously, you know that you're at the Preservation Board, and you're, you would expect from us that we're going to say that we would like it preserved in place. Have you considered the cost of the rehab? All of those kind of things, which I'm sure you have. And so I'm, I fully agree with everything Chris said, but I'm just trying to take the next step forward. You've asked, it's really great that you've come to us and asked for any additional guidance. And so I'm just gonna focus on that part. Um, the calling it a replica barn is like not true. It's not a bank barn. So I guess, I guess my main um, reaction is like, why bother making it not really a replica? Like just build a barn, like any, if you want to have a barn on the site, like the gambrel roof, I don't know, it's just like, it's not close enough to be really expressing the history of the actual barn. So like barns are cool, you can probably rent them out for weddings, people love that, but like it's almost so different that just build whatever barn you want. <laughs> like that's my opinion um, because the window, like it's not even the same number of windows, it's not the same floor, number of floors, all it really has is the same gambrel roof, it's in a totally different location, like it's just not a replica, it's not a restoration, it's awesome if you can reuse the materials just generally, whenever we demolish anything we should reuse materials because it's good for the planet, but to me it's not speaking the history of the barn, like just the interpretation, the stuff you mentioned that, that I think is awesome. I think being able to collect the history, um, maybe one thing you could do that I think you didn't describe was doing like a historic documentation before it is demolished. Like there's the Historic American Building historic Survey. Historic HAPS documentation. Um, like the HABS level documentation so that the history is preserved for the building. Um, it's usually like large format photographs and things like that. But archival, yeah. Yeah, archival footage or level. Um, so I think interpreting the barn, it's just not, it's like Chris said, the bank barn is the fact that it's like that is the most distinguishing feature, I would say. And if it's just a barn, then like, why are we trying to even make it look at all like it? I don't know. 
maybe that's a controversial opinion, but that's kind of my first reaction. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Any other comments? Well, I, I think you've seen that uh, people love that barn. <laughs> There's, there are a lot of very passionate uh, feelings for that barn um, in this community. And my sense is you'll probably hear more passionate c comments about the barn. Um, I, uh, I, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, the uh, photos that we have that you sent us, um, and then in your presentation, um, the illustration of what uh, you, is, is this what you envision Parkview to look like? That is uh, some of the architecture of the townhomes which are in the west side of the property. Okay, so would this barn be associated with these? It wouldn't be associated with them. It will be um, set into uh, open space, called the meadow. So those would be nearby, those would be within walking distance, but it's not associated with the residential. We'll also have the, the commercial pieces and also the apartment pieces as well. Okay, and I just, I wanted to get an idea of, of size. Um, and scale, as, as, as Amy mentioned. You, you know, you show pic picnic um, tables in, in the structure. Um, it, and just kind of, you know, when I look at it and, and think of the size of a picnic table, um, it, it doesn't seem like that's a very large structure. Is that, is that correct? Um, in terms of the exact size, I don't have those stats with me. I would say it is similar in size, although I don't know if it is wider or longer or narrower or shorter compared to the current barn. Apologies for not having those details. Okay. And my assumption is is that, that it, there's going to be a electrical and maybe a, a catering kitchen in there so that you, you can use it as a venue for events or something like that. Is that correct? You know, I don't know if we plan for a kitchen. Certainly we'll have electrical. I mean, it will be built with a, a build permit issued through the city of Littleton. So it will be built to modern code. And in terms of interior amenities, I don't know if we have anything. No, it, it, it's envisioned to be more of a gathering space, not necessarily a uh, you know, catering kitchen bathroom. Okay. Honestly, that was not included in the plans. Okay, I understand. Um, let's see, you asked about the historical consultant. Um, and then is there a, um, anything you would like from us? Um, you know, we do have a, a lot of expertise on this board with, um, a, as you've heard, with historical preservation. Um, and it, it, is, is, there any, is there any way we could be of help to you? Certainly. I think first and foremost, any history on Littleton, agricultural history, photos, uh, stories of, <laughs> you know, townspeople who have made an impact. Um, if we have that kind of information or, or, or the board has good resources for that information and can share that, um, I'd really like to incorporate that into some of the placards that be around the building that tell the story of this area. Um, I'm I, thinking more of uh, any kind of construction or preservation of the building. I could, I, I can give you a great resource for um, uh, all of the historical research that you could possibly want. Sure. It's at our wonderful museum, the Littleton Museum, uh, that has a fabulous archive. And one would hope that your consultant's aware of that and is using that, that resource. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Would it, would it be appropriate um, to maybe ask to see the um, interpretation like the text for the interpretive panels, just to make sure there's no errors in them before you guys put the signs up. At the very least, like, could we have a, a review idea. of that? Yeah, I think we could, we could definitely arrange that. That would be nice. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't have any any other questions, and um, you know, again, I I, I think uh, you know this. People in Littleton just love that barn, and they love seeing it when they drive by on Santa Fe. And even folks that don't live in Littleton that, that drive that corridor um, talk about the barn and ask questions about the barn. And um, I should point out that my front yard has um, Green Valley turf in it, and it's the nicest grass in the neighborhood. So anyway. <laughs> I have one other thing. You said um, you're using ERO. 
Yes. Um, if I'm on the correct website, um, they do HABS hair documentation, which is the building survey and then the engineering record. So you might want to check with them um, if that's an option. Sure. And I think we could do that as well. All right, then if there's no more discussion, um, thank you. And um, gosh, feel free to, to use us as a resource um, in the future. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. These folks a moment to, to clear out, and then we'll move on to our next agenda item, which is windows. Wild about windows. <laughs> yes. Sir. Just a moment, we'll get the presentation loaded. Okay. While well, we're young, please, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, eventually, uh, it would be good to have feedback of, of whether that uh, was valuable for you, that discussion. I know it's a little out of the ordinary for a historical preservation board, but I knew you know, as staff was processing this case, we knew you'd have an interest in that in that barn uh, and, and the development plans for it. And it's not uh, it's not the ideal of what you you may want for the barn, but it uh, you know I'd be interested in feedback if that type of thing is is something we should bring back to the board or not. I liked it. I mean, it's depressing, but. Um... At least, like we're aware of it, instead of just driving by one day and it's gone, kind of right. thing. Mm -hmm. That at yeah. least maybe we gave them some food for thought, yeah. and maybe it'll affect them on a future project that they will consider other things. Um, I also know um, I have friends who are historic preservation consultants in Denver. I mean, they do stuff for the National Park Service and all over the country, actually. Um, and they've been doing this for about thirty-five years. And um, the husband on the team. Um, he has been hired by Fort Collins. Um, whenever they have a demo permit come in, the um, demo applicant is required to have a qualified professional, a historic preservation professional, come in and document the entire resource before it's gone. Yeah. And, um, and so he you know, goes up to Fort Collins somewhat consistently, um, but at least there's some kind of record of what was there. Um, right. And, you know, some of it, it's nondescript, kind of, you know, it's not eligible. Um, you know, in this case, like, we have an eligible form that could qualify for grants and stuff, and, I mean, there's potential there. Um, right. So, it's, uh, yeah, I, it's, I know, it's uh, tough, but at least, you know, like I said, they, at least they came to us, and, you know, maybe, if they get another project, they would come to us sooner now that they know um, our feelings and, and that we're here and that kind of thing. So. Of course, we have been talking to them for a number of years now. Oh, okay. And have been made them aware of the grants that are available mm -hmm. and the significance of the property. And uh, who I saw here tonight, I think they're relatively new to the Toll Brothers team, but who we've worked with previously. They no, maybe they're a little bit interested, uh, but just couldn't really get them to engage in this property and think creatively about how they wanted to do it. And without that designation, we were unable to really secure anything more than what you see here, some sort of a, if you want to call it a, you know, 
Andrew. Power. <laughs> Jason, you have a question? Never. And, and I appreciate yeah. you saying that because it, it is, it's, it's tiny. not, yeah. it's not, yeah. it's like, yeah. There's nothing that really connects the two, and, and you, you wouldn't go into it feeling like, oh, I'm in a bank barn. And I think because a bank has a slope, you could make that accessible um, very easily. Yeah, it's true. That's, uh, that's, that's true because it's a because it's a ramp. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's true. It's a grass ramp. You know, you could. Um, so, Jason, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to say, to the extent that this was a, a essentially a focus group for these guys, I think it was valuable. Uh, I think that your comments were great. I think yours because to the extent that they're still just dealing with a bunch of CAD drawings, maybe they take some of that into. I'm just guessing, and maybe not. Realistically, not. But who knows? You know, they, they might take it into. Uh, I really got a lot out of your comments, and I hope they did too. And so. well, I'm familiar with Toll Brothers. They've done a lot of work in Virginia, mm -hmm. and um, namely around Civil War battlefields. And they've been really respectful. Um, so I was hopeful <laughs> until I saw the thing, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is <laughs> it's, and, and I love barns. Like, I've documented so many barns across the state, and it's just bank barns are very unusual. Yeah. Well, it is. It's absolutely unusual. There's not another one, certainly in the South Metro area. Um, and I don't think there's one in, you know, all the way up to Broomfield. Um, They're just very I think the, the, one of the real keys is um, it seems like the, the horse is already out of the barn, so to speak. <laughs> but um, the documentation is, I mean, that's something you can do now. I mean, you can, I think you can require that now. And uh, because that's a, that is a significant story to tell. It, it, it really figures into Littleton's history and that building is significant. So the documentation I think, I think would be fabulous, but. Well, I think the, um, the amount of money they're going to make on the number of units going in, um, they could shell out a little bit for hats hair documentation, and that way at least we have yeah. archival. Okay. We, we won't get into their business plan or anything, but um, okay. It, anything else on, on the barn? No, it's cool. I'd, lo I'd love more of that. Uh, to, your, to the extent that your, your question was, are we interested in hearing these? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The better. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be informed. Yeah. Let's go with that. Teach us about Windows. Windows. Okay, well, good evening. I'm Andrea Mimnall, Senior Planner with the Community Development Department. And tonight's study session is second in a series to explore the idea of establishing a window policy to complement the city's historic preservation program. The first discussion was held at HPB's January meeting, and the purpose of that was to determine how a window policy could be beneficial to the preservation program. And then HPB provided staff with policy topics to explore in more depth. And so uh, tonight's discussion will be about what HPB wants to see in the policy based on the identified topics at that January HPB meeting. And to assist with tonight's discussion, the January packet included examples of window policies from other communities, which the board had an opportunity to review, and some other materials and also a video on historic windows. In tonight's packet, staff included a list of HPB member comments from the last session, just to try to capture what's been discussed so far. And then also tonight, of course, was the self-guided walking tour. This was included in your packet, and so hopefully, at least some of you had a chance to do this over the weekend. And I'm hoping that everyone feels that they are reasonably informed for tonight's discussion. And so we're going to just quickly go over these policy uh, questions that were identified last time around. The first one was, how does an applicant make a case that a historic window is beyond repair? And second one is, are any windows exempt from the requirements of the policy, such as windows not visible from the right-of-way? The third one is, are there any recommended or prohibited window materials? 
got four and five, but I couldn't get PowerPoint to see numbers four and five there. Sorry. So number four is what dimensions must be followed in any replacement window? So the frames, sashes, mullions or muntins, sills or casing, anything else? And then finally, should there be any standards for non-contributing structures in historic districts? And so those are the policy questions for discussion. And Kim, I'll turn it over to you. And if you, we want to or we want to just go through the questions one by one and have a discussion, I'll be taking notes and happy to jump in at any point. All right, thank you. Um, I hope uh, folks had the opportunity to, to kind of walk around town a little bit and, and look at windows. Um, it, it's it, actually, it's really fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I learned a lot. And, um, I, you know, it, it, for one thing, the windows in this town are really visible uh, on these buildings. I mean, you really see them. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it, it was just fascinating to me and, and fun thinking about some of those windows that uh, I, was, I was wondering how well some of them continue to function. Um, but they're still there. They're still hanging in there. So, okay. Um, do we feel uh, that we want to just go through through this and, and answer these questions and give give some guidance to Andrea going forward? So we will start with question number one. How does an applicant make a case that a historic window is beyond repair? Anybody have any ideas? Yes, ma'am. I'll start. Um, I think one of the policies that we reviewed in January, um, a, a um, staff member made a site visit, and I liked that idea of going to see it and um, maybe taking like have a staff member and an HPB member go and look at it. Um, I really liked that. Um, I think photos are important. Um, I, I don't know if it was the same. Um, community that also they liked um, they required a professional to write up a report yes and, and we have done that here as well and I you know but I keep thinking about at that meeting we talked about we want to make this easy for people like we don't want them to feel like this is this major hurdle that takes them so much extra time or money and, and so forth so I, I kind of go back and forth with like, I, I don't want them to just say, oh, yeah, it's rotted, and so we just have to take their word for it. Um, but I also don't want to feel like they have to shell out hundreds of dollars to, or thousands of dollars to hire a consultant either. But um, I just don't want them, you know, calling up a local window company and saying, oh, yeah, your windows are bad. Um, I feel like we need more of a professional opinion. And maybe that is something where it's somebody on the board along with staff going out. Maybe well, staff. I guess they, um, uh, and maybe Ashley, you can speak to this. If this were an application that were go to the board, then we would have one HBB board member who had more information than the others at that public mm -hmm. hearing. Some of that, depending if it's written into policy like that, that you guys are trying, it's, you know, like you said, trying to alleviate some of the issues and things that may just be decided administratively, potentially. If it ends up going in front of the board for whatever reason, however this is structured, that could be something where that board member can have a conversation with me. Is it too involved that you may need to recuse yourself off that decision? Or by divulging it, I'm assuming whatever you would see by going out there is completely... Um, documented by staff as well and presented as part of the hearing and then it should not be an issue where you'd have to recuse yourself because everyone be, would be made aware of all of the same information. So kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think you can build in uh, a process for that where you wouldn't have an issue. Yeah, I think, um, Chris, you raise a, a really important point that the window policy itself, um, I think that uh, we are, are going to spend a lot of time on the window policy. And one of the, the reasons is because we do want to streamline things for applicants and you know, property owners and, and for staff as well. We want things to, to move more, more quickly um, and uh, you know, we don't want to be an obstacle. And um, we also don't want to you know, put an undue financial burden 
on, on a property owner. However, um, you know, property owners, they have to know about a lot of different things. And, you know, I don't, I don't think they're necessarily window experts. I'm a property owner and I'm not a window expert. Um, and, and so um, I, I think, and because a window replacement, you know, is, is a big deal, it's so visible. Um, it is the kind of thing, you know, that you would want property owners to be able to avail themselves of the expertise that staff could offer them. Um, so I, I think our goal is to try to, to have a pretty robust window policy, but also, um, you know, have one that actually works so that uh, there aren't any, any kind of surprises out there. Um, I, I guess a good question right now would be how do we have a deadline for having this window policy? Um, like, are we expecting to approve this like at a next meeting, or are we still? We have a couple months of discussion um, because I think we're going to have a new board. Well, a new board member um, <laughs> um, next month, and um, we have board members that aren't here tonight, and so that we all get a chance to make sure everything's addressed properly. Yeah, so the plan is that at the next meeting, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be presented with a draft mm -hmm. based on tonight's discussion. Okay. And then, uh, you know, it may take more than one meeting to get that draft in okay. a you know, place where everybody's comfortable, and then okay. uh, there will be a public hearing, and okay. uh, property owners of designated property would be notified of the public hearing. Okay. Um, just as an aside, uh, the City Council decided to reduce the number of HPB members, and so actually we will not be getting a new board member. Okay. So we just lose. You are irreplaceable. <laughs> In many ways, yes. And this, this was the case with other boards as well. OK. So not irreplaceable. Not yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's not like we need this done by you know May 1st kind of thing, that if we needed an extra month to, because we want to revise Next month's draft, we, you know, so it, it's, our, it's our own timeline, right? It's not being driven by a request from council. It's not being driven by council or necessarily by staff. I think what we're looking for is a good policy. Okay. So we just want to make sure we do it right. And, it's right. Right. Okay. and you're consider you're thinking about uh, presenting a draft at the, the next meeting. And a draft means that, you know, it's working to yeah. do something tonight. <laughs> yeah. It's Okay. Yes, I, I, I just want to make sure that we work like under this time crunch yeah, and you're good. Okay. And I'll also take the opportunity just in case anybody didn't have an opportunity to do the walking tour this past weekend that it would still be I think worthwhile to do it over this next month in time for the review of the draft. There might be uh, there might be insight that you gain from that tour that you could share with the with the board with that draft. Can I ask a question, Ashley? It was the question I asked in, in the email that I, I shouldn't yeah. have asked in the email. I know the question you're going to ask. Is and it okay? It, it's the, I can already tell you. You can only go with one other board right, member. Right, that's what I was going to say. If anybody yeah. wants to go out, yeah. um, <laughs> let me know. Obviously, it's, it can only be me and one other person, but um, I, I'd like to go again. So. Well, the, the bottom yeah, so line is different things with different people. Mm -hmm. um, so. We have our Noah's Ark policy where there can only be, we can go two by two. <laughs> two by two. Um, but uh, having done um, the, uh, the tour um, by myself and then with someone else, um, it's better together. Um, so I would really encourage um, if, if we can informally put together um, twos uh, to go out, maybe if, if we ever get a nice pretty day again, which I'm sure we will. Um, <laughs> I do have a caveat on that, though. With the recent um, yeah. judicial decision that was made in the Doug Coe school cases that I passed along to you all, that the open meetings law is being reviewed by courts right now, and what that looks like, even if you are two by two. What the court found in that case is related to kind of this game of telephone, right? Where you had two people meeting about something and then two people meeting and then maybe one splits off here and one here and you start talking about what you discuss with that person. That's really starting to talk about public business 
in more than groups of two is what this court found. And so I would really caution you, don't keep redoing these. The place to talk about what you found with one other person at any other given time is once you're back in the study session and doing it openly in the public. Um, and so go do it, but do not keep doing it with a different person and discussing what you learned from someone else um, because that is really kind of what's addressed in that DEDCO court hearing that we're waiting for further guidance on. So but, once is enough. Yeah. So I went out by myself, so I, I have not gone out with anybody to look at windows. Okay. I know it gets tedious, but, you know, got to make sure you guys are aware that's no, no, at least the state of it, and it's just easier. Bring it back here and do it openly. Okay, so we can go with two, but we can only go with two once. That's a question. Uh, so the, the question before us was, how does an applicant make a case that a historic window is beyond repair? And I, from what you've said, I think what you mean by that is not what are the rules on how we define beyond repair, but how does the applicant literally present, literally get and present their case, saying, I have, I have a window, it's beyond repair, I want to replace it. And you go, okay, prove it. And so they do. What are the, what are the following three things that the applicant needs to do? Um, I agree with you that it would be really cool if, if I own a business on Alamo that I could look it up <laughs> <laughs> on the site, and it could say, okay, it says, I have three things. Yeah, photos. Yeah, it seems I mean, to me that yeah, shouldn't cost me thousands of dollars because I probably carry a very high-def digital camera in my pocket, and as long as it meets certain requirements the city gives me, you know. Yeah, and, and I don't think it has to be anything like archival photos or anything like that, but it just, it, you know, some cl close-up yeah. pictures that show that right. really... That and it can prove that you meet some criterion that that, that you guys will set, like, I don't know, I don't even know what it is, like, if something's beyond, like, is it, Rot. does it mean that it's, it's a certain yeah, percentage exactly. rotted, right, yeah. a certain number of panes missing, a certain percentage of the glass is gone, or, or, or a certain, you know. Yeah, or, you know, replaced over time. And right. They, anyway, it would be interesting if there's a list of rules, and it goes, okay, I think that one, two, and five apply to me, and I think that I can use method A and B to prove it, and the meeting is next week, and so I'm going to bring in my, my thing. Um, that'd be super easy. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea if we could find a policy that did list those items, because, you know, we talked about maybe, you know, maybe taking notes, but it is the applicant that needs to make their own case. Right. And so they need something to work with, mm -hmm. right? And so I wonder if there is uh, a policy out there already that's had the opportunity to be tested how it works. Of course, I don't know what that where that might be. And I don't you know if you have any ideas yourself. Um, um, but, I mean, that would be something like throw the question out on the Facebook Historic Preservation Professionals page. Yeah. Like, who has a window policy um, where an applicant has to, you know, like, how does an applicant make a case? Do you have a list of things that they have to meet? And it's, you know, photos, um, site visit, whatever, you know. Yeah, See if, if anybody kind of, um, and usually there's always, you know, at least 50 comments on every survey kind of question like that. And so maybe we could find a couple idea. different communities that way and then look at those cities' websites or contact their HP. Yeah. specialist and see how they handle that. So That's pose that exact question. Yeah, just like we are, you know, in Littleton, we are looking at um, creating a window policy and um, why reinvent the wheel? Right. <laughs> Does anybody yeah. have a policy where there are certain criteria and, you know, people have to come in and say, I have photos, I have this, that, the other, um, you know, like you said, you know, one, two, and five on this one, and you know, A yeah. and B on this one, and you know, and can we see? You know, would you be willing to share your policy, or can you give us your website so we can look at it, That'd just so great. we can, yeah. you know, come for comparison sake? Yeah. And I think Andrea knows yeah. what kind Thank of you the for the idea. I do. Yeah. I am. I'm on. I'm on that. Okay. Yeah. Serve, and I read it all the time, and in all my years, I actually don't remember that question. So we'll yeah. probably benefit be a lot of communities <laughs> to be able to, to read that as well. Yeah. Okay. And, Good. and sometimes people pose questions and like, 
this might have been up here before, but you know, I'm new to the group kind of thing. And, and so yeah. people don't mind. And there's always new people joining and different communities, you know, getting involved with it. So and, and you can search it too. Yeah. So I think we could, um, I think we could get something there. Lisa? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think a window survey is something that should be required and it can be either just photos that the owner takes themselves and, you know, documents what each window, like window number one, um, and gives good photos, or it can be a consultant giving, you know, and it depends on the scale of the project. They're, if it's a bigger project, they might have the budget to actually get like a historic consultant that analyzes the, the um, condition of each of the windows, or it can just be somebody's house and they just take pictures and they show us like what you guys were saying. Maybe there's five features like rot and a broken what, pain, everything we just said that they Still need to meet. Or something, and the, yeah. yeah, I was thinking the National Trust, I mean, everything, it's hard because like the real strict preservation would say that everything should be repaired. So it's hard to, yeah. or could be repaired. Um, so you'd have to find something that's a little more convenient, I guess, than maybe what the National Trust would say or what they would say for rehab. But I think that just a window survey requirement isn't too onerous for any scale of project. But I do think, and I think in bigger scale, it would be behoove them to use a historic consultant, like if they have 50 windows or something, and go through it. But if it's, you know, two windows, they're trying like to replace Like if it's the courthouse versus yeah. a building on Main Street that is, you know, connected to other buildings on each side where they would only have... Right, where they have four windows, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And close-up photos overall photos, just a window survey, either requirement, that's what I think. All right, uh, we're ready to move on to question two. Are there any windows exempt from the requirements of the policy, such as windows not visible from the right of way? <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> I feel like I'm always gonna be like, um, but this is what you want, right? You want comments. Um, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about this. Um, you know, I want to say, like, the rear is kind of, but I feel we need to do, um, distinguish between commercial and residential. And I think the other thing we need to keep reminding ourselves of is this policy applies to all of Littleton. It's not just Main Street. Mm. And I know we're, the, the tour kind of focused on Main Street, but this is going to be something that, covers all of Littleton and so um, you know residential um, we might see you know just as much um, as we would with commercial and so you know on a historic house are we really going to see the rear of the building probably not we don't have alleyways you know like Denver does but in you know, the downtown and Main Street and Alamo, it, is, it does make a difference. And so in that regard, I would say, you know, like buildings that are on the corner or um, I'm trying to think of which one it was. The, is it, oh, the course building where you can see everything. Like, yeah, then having vinyl windows in this would, or sliders would really change the building. And so I feel like in that regard, yeah, um, you know, it would be a problem if we said the rear was exempt on that one. But we had that house on Louthan Street that was doing the rear addition mm -hmm. that we had the COA for, and we looked at windows and, and how it was situated and followed the guidelines, and, and we approved that. But I think it's different because it's on the rear. You know, it's in an alley. Yeah, there is an alley. Oh, there, there is. House. Okay. Yes. An alley, by the way, is also right of way. Mm -hmm. cool. And so when you say not visible from the right of way, that would include side streets and alley, mm -hmm. as well as the main street. Mm -hmm. I guess I would say a significant portion of, you know, residential doesn't have alleyways, um, like the downtown does. And so, I guess, well, also, to call it right of way is, okay. is accurate. Then okay. you don't have right to right mince words. But there's a use thing that's different. I mean, the Coors building, that whole building, at least three sides of that building, are in constant view. Mm -hmm. From traffic and business and just just the yeah. everyday every everyday commerce of downtown, uh, and that's not the case with almost anything else. So there's got to be a way to say something like, I, I, and I, I don't know what the magic words would be, but there's got to be a way to say that the use 
um, an exposure to those to those rear uh, windows is different at the Coors building than it is behind your house or my house. Or, yeah. Well, and I think corner buildings. You know, when yeah. I'm not, I mean, I, I survey buildings, and you know, when we take pictures of the corner, and we take five pictures instead of three. Mm. Because, you know, when you're on a regular street, it's one and then the two obliques. But when you're on a corner, you know, you can see the two obliques, the front, the side, the rear. Mm -hmm. um, so you really are kind of exposed to everybody when you're on a corner like that. And so it does matter. And I think one of your, the points that you made was that this is for the entire city. And it's very, very different in um, some of our residential areas. But um, having done the tour downtown, mm -hmm. Um, quite frankly, I didn't see any window that was not visible from the right of way. I mean, there, you know, we have alleys, we have, uh, you know, alleys that are used, they're working alleys. We've got that one fabulous alley that's four blocks long. We talked about activating that alley. Yeah. People are using it. Um, and, and you can see it. You can stand on one corner and you look you know, a block away, and you can see the windows. The upper stories certainly are visible. From yeah, there. they really are. I, and and it's, it's just, I was amazed at how, how much visibility we have at all of those windows. Um, and uh, so as, as far as uh, that, that Main Street Historic District, the Downtown Historic District, um, I don't think there are any windows that, that, that are exempt. Really yeah. are exempt, yes, ma'am. I think that the windows that are actually invisible from the right of way, though, should have should not be something that we review as a board. Like that should definitely be an administrative review. Yeah, right. yeah. And there should still be guidance for those, I think. But I think it should be more flexible. Um, so, if we go with something more specific, like material or size or things like that, or things that are visible from the public right of way, the ones that are not visible, maybe it's more, it's just more flexible what they can do with that. Um, Cause I don't think that that's something that, um, definitely not something that needs to come to the board if you can't even see it from, from the public right of way. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you can, historic preservation, there's always an art to it. You can't create, you can't create standards that apply in every situation because it really is visual you know looking at it you have to make your determination based on what you say on what appears to be correct and there's some things that appear to be not consistent with uh, historic character right and I, I it's not that it wouldn't be reviewed it'd be reviewed by staff and I trust that you would make that decision and be able to apply the policy without having to bring them to a board for that is there ever a time where like the right of view would change like if buildings around a historic building change. So like where one window may not have been visible, if a building around it changes, then it is now visible? Unlikely, but I guess that is certainly possible. For example, if you had a non-contributor on Main Street mm -hmm. and it was approved for demolition, right. and now all of a sudden you have a vacant lot in the middle and all of a sudden it yeah. turns out that there are some windows on the side that all of a sudden after all these years yeah. Well, then the policy would apply. I mean, magically, they're visible now, and so yeah, the policy right. would apply now. Unless they'd already been replaced. Sure. Yeah, true, truly historic, would that then change? Which is something to consider, maybe. Well, how about if something comes to you that's supposed to be administrative, and you feel it needs more guidance. Is it something that you could make the decision to bring it to us? Yes, with all of our applications, okay. with our administrative level certificates of appropriateness, it's built into the code that for any reason staff says we want the board to see it. Then okay, so that it, that's, you know, a, that's the process. We really have that possibility that mm -hmm. if something unusual came up or, or you're just looking at this going, you know, I just really would like to talk <laughs> this out with with the board, then you could always bring it to us and, and we could. Sure, it sounds like it's in there. Very good. All right, question number three. I can already answer it for you. <laughs> Are there any recommended or prohibited window materials? Vinyl. 
I have vinyl windows. I have vinyl windows and I hate them. Um, so, so they don't last? Is that the deal? They don't. Um, so I had a house in Aurora when I lived there and within nine years we had a, um, a nine foot window that was vinyl and we replaced it three times. Oh vinyl cracks. It, in our temperature, our climate, it's dry so it cracks the seals and um, it just bakes in the sun. Oh. And it, when they take them out, they go to the landfill. And I think the fact that um, this packet that you put together, thank you, um, you know, 116 year old original windows, 150 year old original windows, 117 year old original windows, that tells you something. You know, those windows. Nine years versus 116 yeah. years. Yeah. 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 So, um, and I, we had a, a mini retreat, um, Historic Denver and the city and county of Denver, and they're the ones who are basically what we are, um, landmark staff. And we talked a lot about windows, and um, they are trying to um, accumulate some statistics on longevity and um, because the window sales people go out and talk about how energy efficient they are, and they're really not that much more energy efficient than you know a historic wood window. And there's a lot of different options that you can do, um, do to make a, a wood double hung window. Um, energy efficient that will cost you a fraction of the price of putting in a new vinyl window that you will end up replacing, you know, in the next 10 years. Well, it, Can I ask anybody who knows? I, I'm sorry. Can I we're please? not really here to debate the... the no, no, no. I, I, was, I, was, I was just trying to understand more. This is, this is just me learning. But, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it is a good point that, uh, uh, you know, probably, oh gosh, when you get south of Ridge Ro Road, basically everybody has vinyl windows. But, you know, in, in 50 years, when um, my house comes before the Historic <laughs> Preservation Board, um, you know, who's going to talk about, well, what are the original uh, materials? Mm -hmm. They're vinyl. Yes, but those windows won't be there because they will have been replaced multiple times. <laughs> because they won't last 50 years. Vinyl they're windows are constructed. Years old. They're hanging in there. 26 years old. <laughs> uh, just uh, the Masonic Lodge, just as an example, um, says all the windows are original. Windows. But if you, uh, and so this is just me learning about the, what's me. So please forgive the ignorance of my question. Um, but the windows, when you get close to them, are you know the, the sills are of different of different composition from one another. Some are aluminum, some are wood. And, you know, so, I, I, how are those the original windows if they're so different from them? Yeah, are there storms on them? Yeah, I think they're storm windows. Yeah, I think I have seen storm windows on there too. Oh, okay. So and I'm looking at a facade. So there. Jason, yeah. would you like to go do a window tour together? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if she'll let me. The, uh, the <laughs> I, I went out by myself. Yeah. Understand the rules, please. Yes. Just follow them. Yes, yeah. Of course. Got to ask for permission. Or we can go out, like, just. No, I would. I would love that for educational purposes I would, I would to just totally, kind of point out different totally things about that. them. Not, yeah. Since you, because I, I don't want you to feel like you're asking ignorant questions. I it. it Every time you ask a question, you're like, forgive me, you know, yeah. you're learning and, and that's good. You're asking questions when you don't understand something. So don't feel like that's a bad thing. Right. That it, you're taking up time like that's, you know, maybe somebody else well, has the same question you do. But, the, but I, I, I appreciate your offer. That sounds good. I okay. think that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Cause there are a lot of windows that it looks like they've been replaced, but there's storms on them. Okay. Who they've gone with or just follow no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just totally cool. I got it. Do you know what the material is on the hip, the JD Hill store, the one that had the car crash into it? Oh, that was so sad. The replacement. One well, closest to the corner. Okay, when yeah. you turn in, mm -hmm. when you first come into downtown office. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, we didn't actually walk up to it. Your question oh, was, right. which window was it? You can tell when you look at it. No, what's it made of? Is it, yeah. Oh. You touched it. <laughs> I'm just wondering, it was that vinyl? And what I wanted to do, and I recommend everybody do, bring a magnet with you yeah. so that you can stick it on there and see if it's a steel window. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious. Or okay. non ferrous metal. Yeah. I know a lot of the new windows are um, a wood and fiberglass yeah. combo, um, but they still. And the muttons are like stick-ons, and so they 
the dividers. Um, yeah. So they look very fake. So it's and it's really just thin. one window that's been fake divided into eight, right? Yeah, yeah. it is. It's it's a single pane of glass instead of the individual panes. I don't know if anyone does the individual panes anymore, unless it's a real historic preservation project. Yeah, it it, it would be custom prepared for them. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> So anyway. I'm on the fence of, about vinyl. I would say that they're, I think that they're not able to meet the other dimensions. So they would be kind of excluded anyway. If we were to be specific about frames and mullions and muntins and things like that, then you wouldn't be able to find a vinyl window, especially the casing can't match a historic one. Um, I do go back to the flexibility of like, if that is somebody's house and it's on the back of their house, why do we yeah. care if it's vinyl and it's not like, yeah, we get, see, why do I we wouldn't care about, um, but if it's like a main street, you know, the main commercial um, window, I do think vinyl is inappropriate because it's not able to replicate, replicate. If you need a magnet to figure out whether it's yeah. steel or wood, that's a pretty good replica. It's a good replica, right? right? right. right. Final yeah. is pretty obvious. Well, and I think like the Elks edition example you gave, um, you know, it says what issues might window replacement bring up. And one of the notes I made was changing the fenestration pattern could make it look more disjointed. And I think I mentioned that in a couple places. Like if, if you're replacing a window, um, what's the one that had the paired windows? Oh, um, on page 17. 2506, it had the two side-by-side -side windows, so a double-hung window next to another double-hung window. If you replace that with vinyl, like, those two windows are narrow, yeah. and the, the dimensions they make now are not that narrow, and so you would have to op make the opening wider to put two of them in, yeah. or fill it in to make it one, you know, individual window, and so that really changes the look of the building. Um, so I think there's something to be said for, you know, it's the vinyl windows, besides the material just looking plasticky, it, you have to make changes to the building to accommodate them. And so then it changes, you know, it's not, yeah, that's not original right. window opening, it's not the same size, it's in, you start getting into, it's really changing the look of the building. So is it fair to say, uh, maybe taking into account some magic words, to facilitate what Lisa wants, which is if something is not at an important view, you know, in other words, it's not, it doesn't have some significance that we define somehow. But if it has significance, then we go, no, no vinyl. Mm -hmm. You gotta have aluminum and you gotta paint it to match the other windows, you know, and, and or, or something, or, or wood, or, or something. Additional material. Yeah. But like, yeah, on, the, on a rear of a house that has no alley. Whatever you want. Right. <laughs> Also, that will get goodwill from the citizens yeah. that they don't have to worry about a but football. I guess, you know, there's a part of me that feels like if you buy a historic building, like you have to have some kind of awareness that it's a different kind of maintenance gig. <laughs> like it's not just I, I can slap whatever I want on my house. It's, um, you know. And like Penny Robin, that building sold, and yeah. you know, was excited about trying to restore some of it. And so, um, you know, now we have a, a preservation-minded owner in that building, which is is different than it's been. Has there been a write-up of that? Because I, I definitely mm -hmm. don't want to derail this, but I'm totally interested in what's going on with that building. Yes, there was so, there was a newspaper article. Yeah, yeah, and that is totally derailing. Yeah. <laughs> so and that's why I'm saying, yeah, yeah, is there article? Yes. Yes. Like a few Sundays ago. Okay. I think if we go back to the question, I, yes. <laughs> I'm kind of leaning towards, it's not prohibited to have vinyl windows. There are some circumstances where it's appropriate and there are some where it's not, but generally it's not recommended for energy reasons, for like for not being able to character. match the compatibility of the dimensions. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would say, but oh, not right. all out prohibiting. Them. Probably like ninety, but like please don't. of the time, <laughs> it's prohibited. It's a historic capture our policy in guidelines as opposed to standards, mm -hmm. or that could be something that we address next time. Maybe there are some standards, and maybe there are some guidelines, mm -hmm. and so the guidelines. That's where you have the flexibility. Mm -hmm. Like anything on the facade of a building, absolutely. Like, yeah, like street facing. Yeah. 
but then with recommended it's hard because it depends on the building mm -hmm. <laughs> so like if there are already wood windows obviously first choice is to keep the wood windows but if you can match it with a really good aluminum then so I think that's the recommendation then yeah original materials yeah original material is always preferable um, but also you have to look at if it's an you know upper story window and uh, it's a fiberglass window, for instance, that, you know, kind of looks like wood and it's three stories up, you know, is that appropriate? Right. And it's probably. I was interested. I wasn't able to do the actual tour, but this was very helpful, the pictures. And there are so many upper story windows that I have never noticed how <laughs> bad of a placement they are. Same. <laughs> you don't really notice unless you're really looking for it. And I usually noticed that windows, but there are a lot that I was like wow I've never seen sliders that. in the upper yeah, story and yeah. one of my favorite buildings and I'm like oh yeah sliders. Like bakery one yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, it, it is amazing some of them are pretty old they've been in there a long time but yeah okay um this question I I gosh I I, I don't know that um I don't know how valuable it is to to go through every single kind of prohibited window material. I mean, it, it could be that, you know, in some cases, um, an aluminum building or a steel window or, or, or a window would not be appropriate, but you can't just, you know, have a prohibition on steel or on, on aluminum or something like that. So, well, and, you know, here's another <laughs> food for thought. Um, what if we have a, say, an 1890 like something on Alamo, and then in the 1950s they put in, you know, steel casement windows. Well, those are historic as well. Right. They, you know, they're not original, but they're still historic. It's not like they put them in, you know, five years ago. They were put in, you know, 70 years ago. So how do we deal with something like that? So maybe you have some that are replacements from the 50s, and then maybe some are the original that are wood, uh -huh. and they want to replace this steel perhaps or the wood perhaps do you try to get it consistent or do you keep with what has been mm. because that's what's that's historic yeah it's like the green bride yeah yeah i you know it's like that's one of our last you know kind of mid-century um updating right and i would you know as, as much as it would be neat to see like what the green bride looks like originally I don't it's really cool like, touching the, yeah, exactly <laughs> you know, the Carrera yeah. vitrolite, you know, at the bottom and that plate glass window and the angled yeah. entrance. It's taken like, on its own historical. It is. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's significant in its own yeah. right. And um, and it shows the evolution of downtown and exactly. how older buildings try to modernize. And, and, and so to your point about the 1950s windows on yeah. the 1910 building, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I just, but I, I think we kind of need to be aware of that because somebody could come in and say, well, you know, these aren't the original windows, so I can, you know, yeah. So the sliders and then there's historical significance. Yeah. Yeah, I so. think it comes, a lot of it comes back to like what the statement of significance for that right. property was. Exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. It has these steel windows, then it's more important yeah. that the steel windows are saved. Mm -hmm. But if it's, you know, about cultural significance or something, then there's more flexibility. So. I'm glad to hear the love for the green bride. Yes, <laughs> yes, and, yes, I and love that's it. that's the perfect example. Um, it, it, it is that 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 remodel um, is is the significant thing about that building at this point. Okay. Um, well, that that do you think for you? But yeah, you recommended, but not necessarily yeah. prohibited. Yes, you can make an argument that as it is, it's, it's, it's historic. And it shows that evolution like in the 1960s, 70s, where they kind of went with that Western neo-mansard roof mm -hmm. on a number of buildings. Yes, yeah. but I think, you know, it's a, you, the property owner in some cases gets, get the opportunity to decide, I want to restore it to this period or to this period. Yeah. So but you can't just kind of take bits and pieces from what you do like. You kind of have to store one or the other. All right, now we're on to what dimensions must be followed in a replacement window. We have frames, sashes, mullions, muttons, sills, casings. 
Does everyone remember the difference between a mullion and a munton? I really appreciated the diagram. I was going to say, yeah, the mullions. Well, the mullions are the separate panes of glass, of which uh -huh. we don't have many in Littleton, right? Yeah, the muntins are the, the separate panes. The divider is like yes, the divider within, the within the glass. What I call a mullion window are the ones that have, you know, the squares. They're individual yeah. panes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the mutton is the, the part, for clarity, like just for argument's sake, um, our discussion, like if you have a divided like window, like and it's a wood window, then it would be wood to make it like, say, you know, nine panes of glass. There would be three vertical and, and three horizontal. Um, and those are the ones that now are becoming stick-on ones on a single pane of glass. A mullion, and that's not on the diagram. I think well, the mullion, I believe, is what we have here. It's on the last the page. page. Oh. It's where you have the two windows together, and then there's a piece that separates the two windows. Oh, OK. Yeah. Like when you have a paired window or a paired window mm -hmm. where you have windows. The in-between piece. Yeah, it's, it's thicker. It's not like the, the individual pane. Piece. You know, it's interesting that um, we have five um, window parts up there. And um, I think, you know, just my opinion, I'll throw it out. I think changing any of those mm -hmm. would significantly change the window. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So I guess the answer that I would give is um, yes to all, to all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that it's, I think so. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think there can be like a little wiggle room. I think I said that last time, like within an inch, maybe, or so, because they just can't manufacture things exactly the same. Yeah. But absolutely, like the number of lights, the sashes, the, the general, opening. Yeah, the opening. Yeah, with, like you said, within it for sure. And yeah. I do think, like, the muntins, the Inter, like if you have the interstitial spacer, spacer, I think is what it's called, you can have the applied, but then there's like a piece of something in between, and so it looks more like it's a divided light window. Mm -hmm. Those usually look better. So mullion is defined as a vertical bar between the panes of glass in a window. So it's between the glass. <coughs> it's vertical, though. Um, oh, just the vertical. It's just the vertical. So then the question is, how about the one <laughs> Let's see. A bar or rigid supporting strip between adjacent panes of glass. And you can, I think, making any of those changes, um, one of them is, um, gosh, I always forget what the, the block is. Um, do, do, do. Because I just walk downtown and I don't pay attention to what the streets are. <laughs> um, the one where uh, the <coughs> ballet physique is in the wine shop. Um, the back of the building. Now, you look at how, how those windows march down the street, and then that one is just so different. It looks upside down, it looks top heavy. Yeah, that's a problematic building. They, they installed them upside down by accident. Yeah. But, you know, that's, this is the, the look. I guess it's Nevada and Main Street. Uh, the Lily Building and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you see those windows marching and down the what street. What you expect to see the throughout. And then it, it's jarring to not see that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, that, that, we should go that way. I will say, at least they kept the same openings. So it, it still does flow in, in that regard. But you're right, it just it does look kind of awkward. So I think that supports the argument that we, we, we really have to have all of those. Mm -hmm. They have to remain in place. Yeah, and um, I hadn't thought about this before, but we might consider adding to this list the profile of those dividers. OK. The profile, explain. So well, on a, on a poor example of um, Muntins, They'll probably just be flat, right? Um, but the originals would have had 3D element to them. Yeah, right? they're kind of beveled or, you know. Yes, right. Yeah. And so it catches the light and the shadow and has a very different look than just a flat. Just a smooth reflection. Interesting. Yeah. 
Or you can like my some of my vinyl windows <laughs> that have it's on the inside between the panes of glass. Yeah. That's where you have that. So yeah. it's just a sheet of glass on the inside and the outside, but on the, the plastic inside. stuff in the yeah. and then I, <laughs> that's the, the JD Hill one is it's just in between. But that's when you have that plus yeah. and they apply it on the outside, it almost looks like it's divided glass. Almost, yeah. Yeah. Almost yeah. Not quite. quite. <laughs> Close, but Close. no cigar. Okay, now let's see if we're ready to move on to the next question. Should there, <coughs> excuse me, be standards for non-contributing structures in historic districts? Yeah. So we have a yes on the table. <laughs> yes. Anybody else? Come on. I think there should be guidance that if there's some opportunity to bring them back to something that's closer to being contributing, then we would recommend that. If, yeah, if, if the windows are the the contention point between contributing. Yeah, yeah. If there's um, or if there's good historic evidence of what it used to look like. Um, I just feel something appropriate, you know, instead of them just kind of. What, how do, yeah, how would you define appropriate? Like yeah, like, like <laughs> of yes, I, I I don't want. My concern would be if there's a building and it's non-contributing because it, it's had some alterations, mm -hmm. that it's licensed to just kind of do whatever they want to it. And so then it makes it worse. Whereas if we can kind of limit the damage, so to speak, because we don't know. I mean, we could have another owner like Penny Robin who comes in and it's like, oh my gosh, I want to restore this building. And so, you know, if you take it, to, you get too, to a point where you've gone too far and you can, you know, it's there's a non-contributing building and then they want it to be glass and steel. Yeah, or so it's, you know. New construction. Yeah. Right, exactly. It's yeah. Non-contributing. So, I mean, you know, when we steel. have infill in a historic district, you want it to be compatible. Sure. And so I would, you know, say the same thing. You know, I'm not saying they have to go salvage and find, you know, 1890s wood windows to put in their building, but it, it shouldn't be like this glittery white vinyl slider window when that's, you know, something that just wouldn't fit into the district. Mm -hmm. And we so. do actually have that in our COA criteria. Oh, okay. About the discussion about compatibility. Yeah. Yeah. So whether you're a contributor or a non contributor downtown okay. or any other district, you have to be mm -hmm. compatible with what's there, not necessarily the same. And we do have <coughs> an example of, you know, a relatively new new building, and that is the, the tavern that um, mm -hmm. I always forget that that's kind of a new building. I mean, it was like 2010. I, when I first moved here from Aurora, I was like, you know, like the brick color is a little off, but, you know, it has the segmented arches. It has, you know, like there's definitely, they paid attention to that kind of thing. And so I think that's when I say, yes, there should be standards yeah, for non-contributing. That's yeah. my point is that's like, it, example. it should complement the district and not detract from it. All right, let's see. Are there other questions or do, do we have any other comments? Is there anyone who thinks no, there shouldn't be standards? <laughs> All right, and now do you have other uh, questions or, or things that you would like from us specifically for this? Right, I think that as in terms of writing this draft for the board, there are going to be questions and I anticipate that and I'm going to fill them in as best I think, or I could even potentially put in options where they come about. And so that we can deal with those questions next time around. And also, uh, I think who, I also agree that our policy should be simple, but I think my approach in putting that draft together might be to put in a little bit more than we want so we can all see what might be available and what we might want, and then we can just start editing from there and pulling out what might not be necessary. Okay. Yeah, windows are arguably the most, uh, you know, that's what grabs you when you look at a building. And they're hard because, you know, they're the eyes of the not all window experts. And think of all the COAs that we do. It's oh my gosh. It's the windows. Mm -hmm. And people are also very passionate about windows. I, I remember um, the city of Arvada has a historic district and People loved that, and there, uh, there were people who were very supportive of the historic district. And when their buildings went in, 
um, they were thrilled, but when they needed to do something with their window, they, you know, their backs got up and said, don't tell me how to hang a window. You know, they, the windows are for fighting, I think. <laughs> they really are. Well, and I want to say, I don't, maybe it was the January meeting. Um, I mean, I know, Lisa, you've said, like, it needs to be, you know, um, user-friendly, you know, for, for people. And, um, and I want to say, maybe it was Rick who, um, he mentioned about having um, links um, to things on the website, like if they have questions, um, like trying to provide them with as much information as possible so that um, they can do a lot of the research or checking things on their own without feeling like they have to immediately contact you and they just don't know where to start. And, you know, the more information and education we can provide, um, the better. And, you know, I, again, you know, Preservation boards are always kind of viewed as <laughs> probably not quite as bad as HOAs, but um, <laughs> you know we want to, people to feel comfortable, and we want them to feel like it's a good thing that they're designated and that we're here to help them, and we're not trying to make this difficult, um, but that we do want to protect and preserve these buildings. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we want to be user friendly. Yeah. We don't want to be the, the obstacle. And Supportive right, right. and not obstructionist. Yeah. yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you, um, I know, you know, we also need to be mindful of staff and, and time and, and things like that. But um, if I owned a historic uh, structure on Main Street, I would certainly be picking up the phone and speaking to the most knowledgeable resource around which is our our, our staff yeah. as far as you know what i need to be doing with my building or what some of my options are that would almost be my first stop but but like you said if we can have options for things as far as like you know the um a window survey and, and trying to make it easy for them to put something together um, and then they could email that in um, without having to contact all these different people and pay money to people yeah I think that would be a lot easier and and you know we can certainly still have like a site visit requirement but that comes after the, the thing comes in you know the back of the window survey and, and I feel always it's, it's important to do public outreach and so having you know board members that are present you know out in the community and, and taking an interest um, is a good thing Rather than always, you know, then it's like, oh, the city won't let us do that. And, you know, it always makes them out to be the bad guy. Whereas if, if you know, like we're citizens too, we live here and, you know, we have a vested interest in this. You know, we do this as a volunteer um, gig. <laughs> and, you know, it, it means something to us too. Um, and it's always best to get out in front of, of the plan. Because if somebody comes to you with the window, they want to install it, you know, they're kind of married to that window and it's hard to get away from it. So it's nice to, you know, get uh, have, have people go in the right directions to begin with. It's a very bad when that happens. Mm -hmm. So um, are we are we happy and good? Do you have, have the direction that you would like? I do. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be seeking more direction once you see the draft. Yeah. All right. Very, very good. And that will be in April. Um, well, we, we believe so, tentatively. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and so before we adjourn, um, I, I do want to say a couple of things. I'm so mad at you that you're not going to be on the board. <laughs> you have just, you know, I just can't say enough about what you brought to this, yes. this party. I mean, you, you, you are just an amazing person and you, you, have taught me so much. You've taught all of us, and you've you've improved things. Um, the the legacy list program that you put together was absolutely awesome, and um, I just I look at you and, and and I think you are just going to do such incredibly great things, <laughs> and it's been a real pleasure to have you on this board. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's, it's been a so pleasure sorry. to be on it. Very I sorry it's been to be here. You'll I'll be still missed. be around, <laughs> but you'll be missed. Yeah, you have a lot of good insight. I, I get very emotional and, and passionate, and and then you say something, and I'm like, 
oh, I knew that, or yes, like that's such a good point, you know? So I am going to miss that from you. Feel free to come to public comment anytime oh, and yeah. share all your wisdom. Oh, yeah. Because you do kind of always bring it back to the actual issue and definitely appreciate your insight. So thanks, guys. Thanks so. a lot. <laughs> And Paige, we're so happy to, to have you and, and a new little baby, and everybody's happy. That's, that's just wonderful. And we don't have Laura with us tonight because um, she just had a knee replacement. Oh. And, is she okay? Um, Doing okay? You know, she is, but it hurts. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so she, she is, is home. She fully expects to be back next month. Um, and Rick obviously is not here tonight, but he is fully expects to be back next month. He's in Texas. <laughs> no, he's in he's in Las Vegas. The bum. That's even he's worse. In Mesquite, Mes Mesquite, Nevada. Oh, there's more than one Mesquite. <laughs> yeah, I think so. There's like a big golf course there in Nevada. Oh, yeah, he's golfing. I know that. Yeah, that's what he's I, doing. Figured it was Texas. Well, Nevada's not much fun. <laughs> but, and also, um, I will be stepping down as board chair for in, in April. So there are leadership opportunities for uh, board chair and um, uh, vice chair. So if anybody is so inclined, if you please let me know. Um, and, and we can talk about what might be involved and stuff like that. Um, and it's it. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it for three years. Um, I was vice chair and then two years as chair, and I've um, I've truly enjoyed it. It's really great. And so I I would encourage you know any, anyone else who would like to take up the mantle of leadership. And I should point out that you do have full use of the um, Littleton helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's such a long commute from <laughs> your house to here. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and I guess if, if there isn't any other uh, business for us tonight or, or discussion points, then we can be adjourned at uh, 8.05. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.